I think that was pretty entertaining. Many of the examples John Oliver used uh, were of course not monopolies, but oligopolies. So not cases where there's only one seller, but cases where there are only a few sellers. But these are also deviations from perfect competition. In general, imperfect competition basically are all sorts of market structures that fall between sort of the perfect competition ideal and the extreme case of the pure monopoly that we have just seen. In these cases, firms have some competitors, but they do not face so much competition that they are really price takers. In the oligopoly case, there are only a few sellers offering similar or identical products to, uh, to, to consumers. But there's another example, sort of monopolistic competition. This is a case where there are many firms, but they sell products that are somewhat similar, but really not identical. And all of these sort of situations like oligopolies and um, generally imperfect competition arise for similar reasons as the monopoly case, essentially barriers to entry. The problem with oligopolistic markets or markets where there's just a few uh, producers are that it's hard to know what is going on. They can be very competitive. Hmm? Uh, they can behave just like firms in a competitive market. Or they can cooperate and collude and sort of split the market and fix the prices um, and behave essentially like a monopolist. And if they do that, they can reap the benefits in the same way that a monopolist uh, monopolist could. So the extra markup, the extra monopoly profits, if the firms are able to cooperate, then they're able to reap the same benefits as the monopolist. And if they compete, they cannot get these benefits. They behave like in a competitive market. And this tension is what characterizes oligopolistic markets. If there's sort of a formalized agreement and these firms collude a lot and in a structured fashion, then we speak of a cartel. And this gets me to the picture. Do you know, do you guys know what this is? This is basically the AdBlue tank, the AdBlue additive that um, diesel engines, some diesel engines uh, use to basically reduce the emissions, the harmful emissions, emissions from, uh, from diesel engines. So essentially starting sort of in the 90s, uh, early 2000s perhaps, VW and other car makers basically tried selling people this idea of clean diesel engines. Mm -hmm. um, and as we know now, this is basically all based on lies. Um, a lot of manufacturers cheated at the emissions tests by basically reverse engineering this the scenario of the emissions test. So the car knows when it's being tested and basically uh, emits less uh, harmful, um, uh, you know, particles, etc., than uh, than in the normal usage. And if you test it under normal conditions, they emit a lot more uh, soot and other particles um, uh, than on the on the sort of testing bench. So this is what what people know as a defeat device. Huh? So um, the car is only as clean as the manufacturers cl uh, claim when it's actually being tested by the regulators. And one of the sort of reasons for how all of this came out, how all of this was found out, relates to this AdBlue tank. Mm -hmm. These AdBlue tanks in the cars are really quite small, and they don't hold enough of this of this liquid that is that is used to sort of um, help clean the um, the emissions. Uh, uh, don't doesn't hold enough to to do this for long periods of time. So people would have to to refill this all the time. But car manufacturers, of course, were aware that consumers wouldn't like this very much. So instead of truly competing on who can produce the cleanest SUV, say, with a diesel engine, uh, basically car manufacturers colluded. They met, their engineers met and discussed the size of the AdBlue tanks. So instead of competing on being clean, yeah, being being uh, environmentally more environmentally friendly than the competition, the car manufacturers coordinated the size of the tanks. They colluded. They formed what is known as a cartel. Um, and this is an important example because it shows that cartels not necessarily always just are about price fixing. Uh, there are other um, other things that c uh, companies can coordinate on. 
and this sort of collusion on the size of the of the additive tanks is basically what triggered the diesel gate and the, the when it came out that all of these car manufacturers had basically systematically been cheating because they had been using these defeat devices that that sort of turn on the clean uh, the cleaning of the emissions only uh, basically under conditions of being tested. Mm. Uh, and this is this was quite widespread in many cars by many manufacturers. And the consequences are severe. So the CEO of, uh, of uh, Volkswagen, uh, Winterkorn, he has been charged with fraud in the US and in, in, uh, in, in Germany, and he faces a f a fines and likely jail time. So forming a cartel can be very profitable but it comes, of course, with the risk of being caught by uh, the regulators and the, and the prosecutors. Let's look at this tension between competition and cooperation for the oligopolists um, in the simplest example. What's the simplest example? Well, the simplest example is a duopoly. So there's only two uh, producers, two sellers. Mm -hmm. And basically what they can do, these two producers, if they can agree, if they can coordinate their behavior, either through sort of tacit collusion um, or through formalized agreements, like in a cartel, um, if they can agree to split the market, huh, to, to both charge uh, a high price or to restrict the quantity, they can behave exactly like, like in the monopoly example before. And we get the same sort of markup, the same quantity, hmm, and they just split sort of the market. Uh, basically. But of course, on the other hand, they face an incentive to move away from this from this cooperative agreement huh? by just lowering their prices, for example, or by competing on other factors like the cleaner uh, engines. Yeah? But usually by reducing the prices a bit, they can, of course, capture a bigger market share and sort of win out over the over the other player, over the other um, competitor and reap sort of even greater benefits. But then the other competitor would also lower the prices. And if they engage in this kind of behavior, they of course end up in the competitive situation. Hmm. That sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? It is exactly the corporation uh, kind of problem that we have seen before. Let's look at a fictional example. Let's say there are two car manufacturers, PW, People's Wagon, and GMW, German Motor Works. Mm. And basically what these, if, if these are the only two producers uh, of cars, say, um, what could they do? Well, let's say the sort of total value of this, of this uh, market that we're talking about is a thousand millions, one billion. Uh? And so if they both um, sort of uh, collude and, and share the market and don't engage in any further um, cleaning, for example, technology, then they both earn 500 million uh, worth of revenue from the from the market or profit, if you want. Let's say profit. So if they both collude and the market sort of is roughly 50-50, they both uh, get 500 million of profit. But of course, GMW has an incentive, has an incentive to compete, say, on cleaner uh, cleaner engines, but the cleaner tech costs money. So the cleaner tech costs 200 million pounds to um, to to implement. Uh, so they lose some of their profit. But on the other hand, if you are the cleaner offering the cleaner car, maybe you sell more cars. Maybe you sell 80% of the cars vis-a-vis 20% for the competition. Mm -hmm. So if uh, in the lower right cell, GMW decides to compete on on sort of clean engines, yeah, and the people's wagon people still uh, don't invest in this clean technology, then what happens? Well, GMW corners gets a bigger share of the market, say 800 million worth of, uh, of cars uh, they sell, but of course they incur the cost of the 200 million of cleaner, cleaner engine development, huh? and they end up with 600 million profit. But of course, people wagon still loses out and only gets 200 million in this scenario. If the reverse sort of happens, that's of course the same. But if people wagon sort of sees through it and says, "Oh no, we're going to also com compete on clean, uh, cleaner engine uh, production," then they both end up investing these 200 million each, uh, and they both end up in this sort of lower right um, uh, cell, and they both get only half of the market, uh, 500 million worth of sales, so to say, or potential profit, uh, but they lose 200 million each for the 
um, for the clean energy uh, for the clean engine uh, development. Huh? So both get 300 million. Everyone sees sort of the logic, and it's the same kind of scenario as the prisoner's dilemma, of course. Unilaterally, both GMW and People Wagon have an incentive to compete, yeah, to try to uh, to to out uh, compete the other um, the other manufacturer and to install the clean energy and praise their own engineering ingenuity and sell the cleaner, better cars. And so they both end up in the defect defect equilibrium if you're talking about prisoner's dilemma or the compete compete equilibrium and that's what we want that is exactly the scenario that we that we would envision for a competitive market so both gmw and people's wagon choose compete install the clean technology and reap the benefits by 300 million profit maybe uh, in in this market but as we have seen in the when we talked about the prisoner's dilemma and the problem of cooperation people and in this case these firms are of course really good at reaping these potential benefits of cooperation huh? neither the leaders of gmw nor the leaders of people wagon are stupid they know that if they can just agree on uh, on sort of collusion on cheating on not installing the clean uh, engines they can make a lot more money and so if there is some mechanism to coordinate this behavior and to maybe punish if uh, if one of the companies sort of uh, goes out of line then they can both end up in the highly profitable collude collude kind of environment uh, equilibrium of 500 million each where they get huge profits they don't have to invest into the cleaner engines and we all lose out but of course this cooperative outcome that is bad for us but good for the uh, for the producers is always at risk is always at risk of one of the parties sort of going behind their back. And that's what we saw in the in the German auto cartel. Huh? One of the manufacturers basically uh, went and went and ratted out the competition and 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 said, you know, look, uh, regulator, look, prosecutors, we would like to be uh, uh, given lenient, more lenient fines, um, and we will deliver you uh, the agreements and the competition, and they face the big fines, and we get away by being the sort of the witness of the prosecution. Huh? That's exactly what happened in the in the German cartel case. Okay, but this tension between competition and the, 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 the potential to defect huh, on the one hand and ending up in what we want, the competitive market type equilibrium, or the sort of collusion cooperation type equilibrium that is really beneficial for the oligopolist, this tension is really what characterizes oligopolistic markets. And this is what has led Adam Smith to famously say, People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. So Smith and economists over the, over the centuries have been well aware of this, of this problem. The most extreme form of this kind of collusion and cooperative behavior by producers in oligopolistic markets is uh, the formation of a cartel. So a cartel is kind of a, a stable agreement between producers to um, you know fix prices split the market uh, engage in these kinds of anti-competitive behaviors usually against their customers against their consumers and this is probably familiar to some of you from sort of the idea of drug cartels huh? the carly cartel uh, in 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 colombia for example huh? Um, so producers getting together, setting prices, carving up the market, carving up territory. And this is exactly what, what you see if you watch Narcos on Netflix. Huh? It's, it's basically a, a business case study for how to set up a cartel and what the problems with it are. So they are usually really official meetings, sometimes with note taking. So it's a very famous German cartel, the cement cartel, where the German lawyers of these companies wrote down everything because they had to make agreements with these other firms. But of course, the regulator, the Bundeskartell, so the, the competition authority said, well, thank you very much for this detailed uh, evidence of your uh, illegal behavior here. Mm -hmm. So cartels usually um, set sort of explicit agreements on output or price um, the, or, or the territory that, that is assigned to different participants. Um, it 
It doesn't always include all the firms, of course, and in many cases it is international because that makes it a bit easier to sort of evade the competition authorities. And of course, it's only really worthwhile doing this in markets where there's sort of the potential for big sort of monopoly markups, big rents, huh? basically where there's inelastic demand. Hmm? Um, and if there's some sort of ability to prevent cheating, to 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 um, to um, observe the behavior of the of the other parties or or, or punish them. Huh? And this is why OPEC is struggling so much because they find it really hard to um, to to enforce the cartel. And there's a really great example in the, uh, of a cartel in the um, recommended readings on the lysine cartel. Huh? Um, and basically, this is super well documented. The, the DOJ summary is warmly recommended. The actual um, FBI tapes, the wiretaps, uh, and, and they recorded actually, are on YouTube. You can watch them get together. Uh, the Jap uh, Japanese company guy and the American guy, and they all come into a hotel suite and uh, laugh about uh, how stupid their, stupid their customers are. Um, and uh, one of them actually jokes about uh, the, whether the FBI is listening in. And it turns out it was. Huh? So um, this is one of the cartels that got, uh, got caught, of course. And this is the base for the movie The Informant with Matt Damon, if you have a lot of time. And the Lysine cartel um, uh, indicates another sort of feature of many cartels. These often happen in very obscure markets huh? um, that are not consumer facing, that face other industry. Hmm? Uh, because, you know, the attention that comes with sort of consumer facing companies, of course, is, is, is something that these cartels do not want. Hmm? And you might think, okay, so why do they do these formal agreements? Huh? Why do they why do they actually like get together and write things down? Huh? Because they're trying to enforce their cartel, of course. Huh? But it's really stupid, of course, because they can get caught. Huh? But, um, you know, these agreements still happen. So the German car industry example is quite nice because somebody then leaked the PowerPoint slides where the engineers were talking about sort of how should we coordinate coordinate the size of these um, of these additive tanks. But in general, the problem, of course, from the perspective of the regulator and the prosecution is that it's not always necessary to formalize these, these agreements and write things down. So it may in practice be quite hard to actually prove that there is a cartel, that there is agreement. So the CEOs of these uh, oligopolists, uh, of these uh, oligopoly companies, are of course fully aware of the issues. And there's a really fun interview, uh, I think, with one of the uh, CEOs of one of the um, electricity providers who said, if I even pick up the phone, I'm already, uh, uh, you know, going to jail. Huh? It's, uh, there's no collusion, you know, I'm not interacting with, with, with my counterpart from the other company. Hmm. Uh, but just look at the price hikes, for example, of the uh, big six sort of energy companies in the UK. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, the behavior perfectly in unison, you know, price rises come at the exact same times, uh, you know, similarly sized. Um, and with what we have learned about the, about the prisoner's dilemma and cooperation, and how repeated interaction is enough to sort of create uh, reciprocity and create a cooperative outcome. Uh, I don't think we need formal written agreements or wiretaps to know what is going on in some of these markets. So the, they don't need explicit agreements in many cases to engage in behavior that, that is not helpful for the consumers. And unless competition authorities have powers to use basically this market behavior as evidence, uh, if they need to bring hard evidence, you know, wiretaps, things like that, then in many cases they will not be able to, to, to fight these uh, oligopolies and cartels. So in the previous videos you learned about monopoly, you learned now about oligopoly and cartel, and we had John Oliver talking about sort of mergers. Mm -hmm. um, and so the last and final merge, uh, video, of course, is about solutions. Uh, it's about how do we fix it? What do we do about it? Mm -hmm. And this is basically the realm of competition, policy, and enforcement. Um, and um, so we have to look at what the US Department of Justice and the FTC and the European Union's Director General for Competition and uh, the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK can do about these problems. Mm -hmm. And merger control, thinking about the John Oliver uh, video, for example, is one of the tools in the, in the toolkit of these regulators.